As I thought of what to prepare for this uh, Sunday, especially as we look at ordination in installation, I thought of two texts. I know one is listed, but the other one I couldn't get out of my mind, and I just thought Romans 1 begins, as most of Paul's letters do, emphasizing that his call to be an apostle and his understanding that all of us are called to be followers of Jesus Christ. And so just again, with a backdrop as to our sense of call, listen to these words from, from Paul before we get to Jeremiah. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised before, beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake, and you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called by his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul emphasizes his sense of call and our sense of call as well. So that's one text that I couldn't get out of my mind to just share as a platform for what we're doing today to set apart people for ordination and to have them say yes to the call in their hearts to be one of the spiritual leaders at this time in this church. But the text I want to focus on is actually another text that you're probably familiar with from the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah has always been special to me. He has a vision and a commitment that is noteworthy to all of us, but he also has a somewhat of a, a sorrowful character and one with which we can sympathize and probably relate to as, as you might look at the entire book. But this section of text is about Jeremiah's sense of call. So again, listen to God's word to you. Starting in verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am, I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come to this service, we come to your word praying for inspiration that we might understand better how you have called men and women, how you call us and need us to be a part of this service of sharing your love in this world. May the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as you read the Bible, you realize that it is just bursting at the seams with astounding and incredible and powerful demonstrations of God's involvement in the world as well as involvement in personal lives. But perhaps the most amer amazing miracle in the scriptures is that scripture reveals to the readers not that God is the creator of the great cosmos or that God brought a tremendous flood to the earth or that God rescued Israel with certain supernatural feats. No, I think it's much more remarkable than these occurrences that there's almost an overwhelming and somewhat daunting realization 
when Scripture says that God needs you. That's the title of the sermon. That's what I want you to hopefully leave this room with and to concentrate and, and prayerfully consider what does that mean in your life that God needs you? You might be thinking, the Lord needs me? It's pretty intimidating as a proposition, don't you think? Anyone whose ego is only a little less inflated than a basketball feels the incredulous assumption behind such a statement. And you're probably wondering, what is he talking about that God needs me? In one sense, of course, God doesn't need anything. God is God. God is omniscient, omnipresent, omni-everything. But God has chosen to work in certain ways that make you and me absolutely critical. As someone has put it, without God, we can't. Without us, God won't. Well, some of you are thinking probably now, surely he's not talking about me. And you know, that's exactly what Jeremiah was thinking. Jeremiah tried to convince the Lord that he was too young, too inexperienced to be a mouthpiece of God. He tries to tell God that God needs someone with real religious clout. Someone who's got a much more meaningful and profound spiritual experience. Jerry's first instinct as you read this text when he gets this call from God is just don't answer it. It's kind of like when you have a mobile phone. You can see Jeremiah pulling out of his robe, his mobile phone, and he sees that caller ID, God Almighty. And he says, hmm, I think I won't answer it, and he won't know. <laughs> God won't know that you didn't answer the phone, right? So then he thinks twice about that and says, well, maybe I should answer. And he answers, and immediately, he doesn't come up with one, but two answers to this question of, Will you follow me? He says, I don't know how to speak, and I'm just a boy. Immediately. Did you notice that his protests come before God even tells him what he wants him to do? Jeremiah can't imagine the Lord needing a young, inexperienced, regular type person like himself for anything. And perhaps some of you have felt that way too. I know through scriptures that many people have felt that way. Many people have tried to cut off God's call or to give God excuses. Even Moses did with his stammering tongue excuse. Isaiah was overwhelmed by his unworthiness. Jonah tried to slip out the back with his misguided patriotism. Peter vacillated mightily and was fearful and impetuous. Paul, he cringed at the thought and had some kind of thorn in the flesh, he said. Each of these people refused to think that they were God-worthy leaders. But God doesn't see us that way. For reasons beyond our understanding, in His own divine timing, God needs you and me. The concept of the Lord needing is strange to begin with. And certainly you would think, as, as I would, that, well, God must want the very best. And so why would He come to me? But that's not what Scripture says, is it? And I go back to Zechariah 4, 6, that probably exemplifies many Scriptures, not by might nor by, by power, but by spirit, says the Lord. And I think of that um, author back in the second century when Christianity was still a minority religion in the Roman Empire. There was this Roman philosopher named Celsus who was an aggressive antagonist against Christianity. He wrote scornfully of these new people of faith and that Christianity is being cared for forth by, and I quote, wool workers, cobblers, laundry workers, and the most illiterate and bucolic yokels. That was his description of the new Christians. But what he didn't understand was that this was also Christianity's strength. Spreading the faith, 
And exercising the love of God wasn't the job of some professional in a robe with an ordained certificate on their wall, but the passion of ordinary people. They are the ones who put legs on our faith and carry it into the places where the general population goes every day of the year. It's like the church banner that says, the sign of God's presence with you is that your feet are where you did not expect them to be. The sign of God's presence with you. So for all of us, but especially to our new officers this morning who will be ordained some, as well as all installed, remember God needs you. And remember especially as it says in verses 7 through 9 that God needed Jeremiah. God utterly rejected Jeremiah's hesitancy to accept his call. And instead goes on to recount how completely the Lord will use Jeremiah. And so remember these verses. Reread them and hold them in your heart. Verse 7, how God insists that Jeremiah go to everyone I will send you and say whatever I command you. Now, some translations are interesting here because it defines Jeremiah's role not so much as a prophet, but as an errand boy, translating the divine word as, you will go on what errands that I will send you. Now, I can relate to that. That puts spiritual leadership in perspective, doesn't it? Doing errands for God. That you and I can do that as God needs us. And then in verse 8, where God says, And don't be afraid, for I am with you, and I will rescue you. Some translations say, and I will deliver you. Jeremiah knew the history of the prophets. He knew that short-term gratification was not on the usual prophet preaching docket. But he also knew the impressive records of triumph that had accompanied those prophets and that the long-term life insurance was out of this world. That makes spiritual leadership in a church look quite tame, doesn't it? And it's only a three-year term which goes by in a flash when you know that God is with you through all of it to rescue you, to deliver you. So don't be afraid. And then verse 9, it recalls similar incidents in the calls of the prophet Isaiah and Ezekiel. Do you remember Isaiah? Both men seemed to have a tangible expression in their life when they were doubting their own abilities, some kind of uh, a remedy that God allowed them to experience God's presence. In Isaiah 6, we read how he, he shares a winged seraph picked up a burning coal from the altar and placed it on his lips, purifying them and the words that he would utter. And then Jeremiah had a vision in chapter 2 and going into chapter 3 as well where he receives a scroll and he's commanded to eat the scroll. But when he does... Ezekiel, I said Jeremiah. Ezekiel, when he eats the scroll, he finds the words sweet as honey in his mouth. Well, in our text, God touches Jeremiah's mouth. And Jeremiah does not envision this as a, as a cleansing process, but, but from that he no longer fears that he will suffer from lack of words. Because he knows what it feels like when God says, I have put my words in your mouth. Jeremiah's authority, his autonomy over all nations and kingdoms is an autonomy through the Word of God. Those very words that God has placed on his mouth. As spiritual leaders, Keep the Word of God before you. Allow God's Spirit to place those words in your mouth and to keep those words in your heart. 
those words of love and good news. You see, Jeremiah is no longer repeating that defeatist four-syllable, I am only, but now responding to God's call, he offers four different syllables, I am the one. You see, one is enough when that one is with God. In God's infinite wisdom and power and divine timing to this moment, God has chosen you. Men and women of Highland, elders, deacons, trustees, because only you can perform a unique kind of ministry at this time, in this place, at Highland Presbyterian Church. You are the only one God chooses for this task. Only you can do the work that God has called you to do. God knows this and wants you to know it too. This is what Paul and Jeremiah knew as they stepped forward as apostle and prophet. And this is what each of you can depend on as well as you step forward as a spiritual leader in this church. Amen.